need to come in power and do something. And so do it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Uh, if you don't have a Bible and you have a phone, just do NIV Luke 11, and uh, you'll, you'll be in the right vicinity. Um, I have been personally convicted that I have done a poor job leading this church in how to pray. I am saying this for me personally, and I'm saying this for us as a community. I want to follow the command of Romans 12, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer. Or Colossians 2, devote yourself or be faithful to prayer, be watchful, be thankful. What God wants to draw all of us into is not a prayer life that is driven by crisis and by when you eat. And this morning, I want to push you. Eugene uh, Peterson, who was from Kalispell, once wrote that our habit is to talk about God, not talk to him. How many of you have been to a prayer meeting that is 50 minutes of prayer requests and four minutes of prayer? You know what I'm talking about. How many of you Christians have been in community groups where you're like, oh, shoot, let's do prayer requests, and then uh, we're out of time, we can't pray? We talk about God. We do not talk to him. 1806, five Williams College students take shelter from a thunderstorm in a haystack, and they begin to pray for world missions. These five students were wealthy, busy, not graduated, and sparked the greatest missions revival in the history of the church. Five of them in a haystack in a thunderstorm. There was the businessman revival of 1857, 1858. Jeremiah Lampier, a neighborhood missionary to poor migrants in New York, was working out of North Dutch Church and he became burdened for the conditions of the church. So in September of that year, he asked people to gather to pray for a noon hour prayer meeting at North Dutch Church. The first meeting, no one was there for the first 30 minutes. Some of you probably know what this is like. And then 30 minutes in, four people came. Okay, we got four. A couple weeks later, there were 20. A couple weeks later, there were 30. A couple weeks later, there were 100 and 200. And then by April in New York City, 10,000 people were praying at noon every single day of the week. The convicting work of God's spirit was so strong in New York City that people would be coming in on ships and they would feel, without knowing what was going on, some sort of convicting power to the point where pastors were called out to the ships to minister to people. Could you just imagine this summer as everyone floods into Bozeman for their family vacation that God reroutes them to an absolute conviction and they don't even know why. Some of you know the name Billy Graham, probably the most famous evangelist in church history. My friend once went over to his mentor's house and to his great surprise, his mentor Ken Conser and Billy Graham were laying on the floor, face down, crying, praying. The battle for prayer is not a battle against prayerlessness. It's a battle over unbelief. Your unbelief, my unbelief. It's a battle over cynicism. It's a battle over secularism. To not pray is to express that you've got this. You can do it. You, you, can, you, you, you got up this morning. I can do it. I can drive in that, on down the roads, whether they're good or bad. I got this. It is the practical sign that you can live without God. School, no problem. Hobbies, I got this. Finding a spouse, no problem, sort of. Travel, maybe you drop one prayer in there every once in a while. Travel, you got this work. I can do it. Kids, oh man, I, it's okay. You can, I can do it. The prayerless life is a battle against atheism. Your own atheism. And so now the parable from Luke. Parables are not allegory. When you read this parable, you're not reading it as, and then this person is God, and then this person is me, and then I identify over here. Parables have one point, and it emphasizes one point. So don't get, get all lost in 
you know, it's, it's this and it's that and oh no, I'm lost. And so maybe, maybe just let me retell it in a modern sense and then we'll come back to it. Let's say it's July 4th and you've had a party at your house. You are exhausted. You have broken every Bozeman ordinance on fireworks and you have blown off 10,000 fireworks at your house. You have fired up your hot tub because your friends are coming over. It's 30 degrees on July 4th at night. Feels so good. You've given twirlers to all the kids. You have singed the grass. You have smoked brisket and you have had hot dogs and you've had hamburgers and your friends ate everything and then they left and they left the trash out. So now you're cleaning up, saying to yourself, why didn't anyone help me? And you be to clean up the disaster, you go to bed and then the door knocks. And they're knocking on the door and they're saying, hey, my friends in Butte's house burnt down because of fireworks and their cell phones were out for some reason. They need uh, food. I don't have any. The stores are closed. They're going to stay with me. So you decide, okay, what am I going to do? I, uh, I'm stuck. I need, my neighbors come over to me. They want me to give them stuff. I don't have anything to give them. I'm tired, but they keep knocking on the door. They expect you to come to the door. You don't want to come to the door. They, they're worried you're going to come out with a shotgun. We're in Montana. You're knocking on the door at midnight. You're going to die if you keep doing this. And then through the ring camera, outside your door, you go, dude, why are you knocking on my door? Because I need food. For my friend, they're at my house. And you take the Doritos bag and you throw it out the window. <laughs> End of story. And then Jesus says, I tell you, even though you will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. And here's point one, shameless audacity. That's the key word in the text. Your, your Bibles might have the word boldness. The NIV is trying to capture it a little better because it can, it's, it, it ha, the word has something to do with being shameless in your approach. Like you just, all the walls are down. So shameless audacity. So go back through the text now. Suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine is on a journey, has come to me and I have no food. So it's midnight in the Middle East in the first century, there's no electricity. And your neighbor lives in a one room house. He is there sleeping with his family. Who are you gonna wake up if you knock on his door? That's right, everyone, oh, there's a little give and take here. We're almost uh, charismatic. Okay, listen. So you're gonna wake up mom, which is mistake number one, because you have woken up children, that's mistake number two. Suppose the man inside, verse seven says, don't bother me. The door is locked, the children and I are in bed. Yeah. I get up. I can't get up and give you anything. So the person doesn't wanna get up, it's midnight, but you're stuck. Your friend has come over and you don't have food. You, you, you don't just, uh, th this person is not just asking for one loaf. This person is asking for three loaves. So it's not like a small little request. You only need one loaf, dude, but he's asking for three. Why? Because bread is utensil. It's the fork. It's the spoon. You need bread to eat. And so he's like, ha do you have any leftover bread? I need it because friends have come over. Now, as you read this story in the Old Testament, what is one of the main themes of how God's people should treat others? with hospitality. Doesn't matter if it's God's people, doesn't matter if it's a stranger, doesn't matter if it's a sojourner, you help out. And so the cultural expectation is, if you come over, I serve you. If you come over, I serve you. And if I don't serve you, you haven't put me out, I'm putting you out. And so you come over to my house and I go, no, I don't have food. I'm gonna put him out. I'm not the one upset, it's midnight. I now have to go to my neighbor and say, I need help, but the neighbor doesn't want to wake up. And then Jesus gives the lesson, if the grouchy friend will throw the Doritos bag out the window at your persistence, certainly God will do even better. It reminds me of Hebrews 10, shameless audacity. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere hearts and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled and he's cleansed us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Before Christ, the temple was the separation place. Everywhere you would go, don't go here, don't go here, don't go here. And in the middle of that temple is the Holy of Holies with this 60-foot curtain that is almost soundproof. And no one goes into the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year who fears God might even kill him. And now the author of Hebrews says, do you see the curtain that is the wall of separation? That thing has been torn in half, the body of Christ. And now you, Christian, can walk into the presence of God that was once feared and ask whatever you want. You can enter with confidence. You can enter not concerned. You can answer like if a kid would just walk into my office when my doors close sometimes. It happens all the time. No, no adult in this room, well, actually, that's not true. Most of you are smart. And you knock on the door. You're nice. You look in my office and you say, huh, oh, Darren's doing something. The kids in this church, what do they do? They open the door and walk in. They don't ask permission. That's the, you, you walk in to the Holy of Holies with confidence. So back to Luke 11, Jesus says these famous words, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, the one who knocks, the door will be open. Ask, seek, knock. That's, that's order of intensity. And the way the verbs work, it's you keep asking, you keep, you keep seeking, you, you keep knocking. You know this, like you've asked for things politely, and then, okay, I didn't get it. So then you're seeking out answers and you go and you search it out. And then as you're going to your neighbor's house, you start doing this. You ever see this in scripture? Just constant. Lord, think of Hannah, 1 Samuel 1, 12 through 17. She kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah's praying in her heart, and her lips are moving, but her voice is not heard. Eli thought that she was drunk. Think of how intense your prayer has to be to think she's drunk. How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I'm not drinking beer and wine. I'm pouring out my soul. Go Eli's like, oh, go in peace. May God grant. That's legit intensity, and she's doing it in a public place. I say that because... Our culture teaches maybe one or two tears are allowed at funerals, but that's about it. You can't have emotion here. This is public. Hannah wouldn't fit in. Or Ezra. What does Ezra say? Then in the evening sacrifice, I rose in myself a basement with my tunic and cloak torn, and I fell on my knees, and I stretched out my hands, and I prayed to God. That's knocking. Is this getting annoying yet? This is the image. Epaphras, Colossians 4, how long will he go? Epaphras, who is, who is one of you and is a servant of Christ Jesus, he sends his greetings. He's always wrestling with you in prayer. I decided to watch a wrestling match with Brock Lesnar last night at University of Minnesota just to remind myself what wrestling was. My goodness, your body gets broken in half. And he's saying, Epaphras is doing this. God, answer Answer, 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 answer. This is the parable. Answer, 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 answer. Man. <laughs> Paul is saying, I'm gonna do my left hand second service. <laughs> Paul is talking about bloody knuckled pounding on doors in our approach to God. Does that feel silly? Does that feel like the way we're taught to pray? You know, it's like, let's all gather to pray. Make sure your hands are right. Every eye closed, every heart, whatever it is, opened. How are you doing? Are you pounding the door? Would you say our church is? Paul Miller, author of The Praying Church, who has deeply convicted me. You know, be careful what your pastor reads. You're going to hear about it. Um, he writes this, 
in the evangelical church in the U.S., the most important part of the week is Sunday morning. Good preaching is the most important part of the Sunday morning, and the preacher is the most important part of the church. Each of these elements, he writes, is not good, they're excellent, but having them at the center where the spirit of Christ should be, this model can be prayer resistant. Saints become consumers. In megachurch, they consume experience, and in theologically astute churches, they consume theology. I mean, think of the ways that you judge a church. Have you ever said, wow, that church has great worship? What, you, what most people mean is the band was good. I don't know if the church was singing, but the production was great. You might say, wow, they are theologically deep. They really love God's word. And what you probably mean is the pastor makes me think and I'm in a Bible study or two. You might say, wow, the community is great, which typically means I found some people who are just like me. Or you might say they have good kids programming. Do you notice what all those are? Those are all things you receive. That's consumer church. That's how we grade it. Have you ever graded a church and said something like, they pray as if God might actually be listening. Have you ever said that about any church that you have considered going to? I mean, just for my own self, when I was interviewing here, no one asked me about my prayer life and I only talked about, hey, what's your strategy? What's your future dreams? What's your theology? What's your ministry philosophy? No one talked about prayer. I just wonder, you know, the global church as I've, I talk about them uh, every once in a while, they are complete infants theologically. And their expectations for prayer and their zeal for it is way beyond what we are. They are mature. An Indian evangelist described his first experience at an American, you can imagine how this is gonna go, prayer meeting. He's visiting a mega church. The pastor is super well known in the United States and even in India for his wonderful preaching. And in the service, the, with 3,000 people, the pastor says, I am burdened to pray. So we are going to pray tonight. And the evangelist was like, we're praying tonight because that means we're going to be together all night and we're going to pray. And so he found out it was at seven. So he decided to get early at the chapel with 500 seats in order to make sure he had a seat. And then at seven, no one was there. And at 7.15, no one was there. And he walked out of the room. He looked at, yes, this is the right chat. There's 500 seats. This is the right place. 7.30, two people walk in, three people. They're chatting about sports and the weather. So they're probably men, okay? And then here comes the leader, 7.45. They pray for five minutes and they all leave. And the, and the evangelist pastor thinks, what was so heavy on the heart of the senior pastor? He's not even here. prayer was window dressing. I was once at a prayer meeting for an Eritrean church in Greece. The woman stood up uh, in the room. I'd say the majority of church was there. And she admonishes us from Ephesians 5, wake up, wake up. And I'm thinking everyone's worked 12 hours today. So this is a good start. You know, wake up. And then 45 minutes of singing and praying. Then personal confession, everyone's on their knees. Then prayer for the church and then to be awake and for each other. And then prayers for protection. Then prayers for people to be saved. Then prayers for people who are against the church. And then for people who are a bad witness and people who are a good witness. Then for those who have fallen away. Then for the sick. Then for those leaders in the country they live in. And then for the leaders in their home country, Eritrea. Then prayers for each other. Then prayers for the preacher on Sunday. Then prayers for the choir. Then prayers for the Bible study. Then prayer against the spirits. Then 20 minutes of singing and then everyone started grabbing hands with individuals and we'd pray for the person across and then we'd switch and then we'd switch and then we'd switch and then we'd switch and then two and a half hours later we have tea and go amen and we all got to get up at six the next morning and go to work that happens every week in that church and once a month they go for eight hours all night we are infants. I mean, just God is for you. Christian, this is mostly for Christians. Christ is for you. You're his glory. Are you banging down the doors for impossible things that only God could do? Have you picked something? It's only God could do this and just prayed for it. 
ever. I don't have interest in doing things that haven't been prayed for. That's functional atheism. I was helped by uh, two images, which I put in the bulletin. I think they'll be up on the thing. One shows prayer, you see that, as part of a church, like here are our plans and here's our HR and here's our money and here's our worship. And then we kind of tag prayer. And then the other one, prayer is the vehicle by which all of those things happen. Feel the difference? Prayer is a checkbox. Prayer is a, oh God, we did it, thank God. Prayer is something we sign up for. Or is prayer the thing that drives this place? Theology is important. Witness is important. Unity is important. HR is important. Insurance for the staff is important. This building is important. It's all important. In submission to a relationship with God in prayer. How should we pray? We should pray shamelessly, audaciously. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need this. It's okay. Now, point two, shamelessly to a loving father. Jesus teaches us to pray knowing that we're loved by God. If you just go back a few verses in Luke 11, you see the Lord's prayer there. And when they say, teach us how to pray, what does Jesus say? Pray our father. Notice that's not my father. They're not praying by themselves. Our father. You know, we... If you've been in Christian circles for a long time, we, we, God's Father, Son, Spirit, but do you, like, think about this. The king of the universe, who rules the universe, is inviting you to call him Abba. You, you, there are still some kings in this world. There are a lot of presidents and prime ministers. When you meet leaders like that, it's choreographed. You get 10 seconds. I'm sorry, his schedule is full. You can't get a hold of them unless you go through four people. And even then, you're not going to have a meeting because of what the meeting might say. But here is God, who is the king over all. And we are like the five-year-old who's throwing up at two in the morning, screaming, dad, dad, dad. And it's not the servants that are running down the hallway to pick up the throw up. It's dad. That's the image. Father. Let me just read it from another passage and maybe just drill this into your heart because I just want you to appreciate the depths of which God is inviting you into this relationship so that you can tap the power that is needed to do anything eternal. Here's Ephesians 1. This is a prayer in Ephesians and, and Paul is praying that your eyes would be open, that you would understand things. And then he drops this line at the end of the prayer. God has placed all things under, this is Christ's feet, and appointed him the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Here is the real reality. God has placed all things under Christ's feet. That's what's real. He has given Christ his son, to the church, his body. We are, what, how are all things and why are all things now under his feet? I mean, it wasn't Christ, God from all eternity. How does this work theologically? It's because Christ has come in human flesh and humbled himself by becoming a servant, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on the cross, so that God has exalted him above every name, so that his enemies are now the footstool on which he rests his feet. All things are under his feet. And what is the reason for his exaltation? So that he may bring his people with him and exalt his people. You know, we think of God as far away when we're spiritually not doing well. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like God, God is distant. He's not. That's not reality. The one who is exalted does not act like a king in power the way we think of power. The one on the throne sympathizes with us. He is our 
brother. He has experienced everything we will experience. He has been tempted like us. This is what reality is. Christ in heaven is moved by our struggles more than anyone else we know. If you have the sad privilege of setting up a Caring Bridge site for yourself or for a family member so everyone can be updated, no one on that list will be as moved for your suffering as Christ is. Look at verse 22. God gave him to the church. He gave him to the church to be our head. He is the head over the church. We are his body. We are united with him. The connection is unbreakable. He sits on the throne, we will sit. He experiences joy, we will experience joy. He will not leave us behind. We are his greatest concern. And there are people who hate him and hate us. And those who touch Christ's church touch Christ. What does he say to Saul of Tarsus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me. Those who try to stop Christ's promises only end up fulfilling them. The enemies of Christ are only able to fulfill Christ's promises. It's just, it must be so terrible to be an enemy of God. My friend was telling a story of a basketball game when he was in high school, and he's playing, and end a game, he gets a steal, break away, and for the first time of his life, the magic hops come out of his legs and he absolutely crushes it and slams it. And he's celebrating, the coach is celebrating, the team is celebrating, and then the fans start chanting, scoreboard, scoreboard. He's down by 30, scoreboard. I think about this with Satan all the time. Satan may dunk on us every once in a while, but honestly, what are the words back to him? scoreboard, scoreboard. He's lost. It's over. When he touches us, he touches Christ. Christ is concerned for you. Christ is united to you. Consider the words of Isaiah 62.3. Speaking of us, you will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The crown is the greatest sign of honor. In Proverbs 12.4, what does it say? A wife of noble character is the crown of her husband. And what does Christ call the church? His bride. We are his glory. In verse 23, the church is the fullness of Christ because he fills it. There's been a lot of commentaries on this one verse and no one's really sure exactly what this means, but it seems that he himself fills us, the church with his glory. And so as you come on a Sunday morning, what kind of God are you singing to? You're singing to Father who has placed all things under his son's foot, feet, exalted him so that Christ can pull us up and exalt us, so that his joy is our joy, so that his reign is our reign, so that our pain is his pain. This is not the God who's like a grandfather. This is not a God who's like the Zeus figure. This is not God who's like a police officer in the car and the rear, you know, windshield and you're just hoping he doesn't turn the lights on and pull you over. This is a God who experientially wants to know you. I, I just remember, uh, was it about a year ago? Two people came, they've never been in church, not Christians, and they were so overwhelmed with the presence of God in this room that it just broke them. It just broke them. They weren't looking for it. It just found them. This whole parable presupposes one word, Father. And he comes back to it now, Jesus, in verse 11 through 13. If a father on earth gives good gifts, how much more? Which of you, when a son asks for a fish, gives him a snake? And if he asks for an egg, gives him a scorpion? If then you are, then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? There's an interesting tension here. The tension is be persistent. Uh, 
And at the same time, God seems to be holding out. Like, why do you have to be persistent to someone who loves you? Won't they just give you what you're asking for? But Jesus holds them both. He, God wants to give you a good gift. He's not begrudgingly giving you anything. He's for you. And yet he wants you to be persistent, banging on the door. And then he goes to this terrible image. And dads, you think about gifts. I mean, most dads think about gifts for about 10 seconds. And then they move on while your wife is in the corner, like coming up with some story, how they all weave together some magical tapestry of gifts. But for dads, they're like, oh, that looks nice. We'll, we'll give it to you. But you still think about it, even if it's for 10, 15 seconds. You strategize with your kids. You're, you're not handing them a snake unless you're awful. Jesus drops, if you then who are evil, <laughs> it's kind of like a throwaway sentence, but geez, Jesus, uh, it reminds you of Romans 3, right? As it is written, there's no one righteous, no one, not one, no one understands, no one seeks God. Just, just remember in this parable, Jesus drops this little line out of the side. Oh, by the way, you're evil. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. If you know how to give a gift, certainly the father who's placed all things under Christ's feet, who has united Christ to you so much that when Christ as the head uh, feels your pain, Christ feels pain, that father will listen to you. All right, point three, the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, this seems out of place. How much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? So why mention that? The parable's about food, right? Like there are other places in scripture where you go, you pray for wisdom, you pray for healing, you pray for the expansion of the gospel. And here Jesus essentially takes the parable and kind of reorients the whole thing because you're, you're persistent, shameless audacity. And then Jesus goes, and he'll give you, the, you're not even asking for the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, and he will give you the Holy Spirit. Why? Why that? Now John 14, he tells his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands, I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because neither have seen him or they know him, but you know him for he lives in you and will be with you. And then a little bit later in John 14, verse 26, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you everything I've said. And in the famous line, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you peace as the world gives you peace. Do not let your hearts be troubled do not be afraid. It's as if God, Jesus in this moment goes, and let me give you what you really need. Hmm? Like we're asking shameless audacity, bang, bang, bang. Knuckles bleeding. And in return, Jesus pours out his spirit on us, what we really need. Thomas Aquinas was once asked, Dr. Aquinas, why is it that people all around seem to be searching for God, yet the Bible says no one seeks God. How can that be, Romans 3? This is what he writes, and it's about prayer. You see your friends and neighbors searching for happiness. They're searching for meaning in their lives. They're searching for healing from their afflictions. They're searching for relief from paralysis of guilt. What you see are people searching for those things that you know only God can give them. Then you rush to the conclusion, since they are searching for the gifts of God, they must be searching for God. The problem with humans is that in our nature, we want gifts without God. Healing, being bailed out. And Jesus flips it around and says, I'm not gonna give you that. I'm gonna give you myself. I'm giving you the spirit. Our church is growing. It's unreal. And you know what? I don't wanna do anything in this church in such a way that if the spirit was taken off this church, we wouldn't even notice. Hmm? We all about downloading theology and all about uh, strategy and all about Bible studies and outreach and missions. Are we pounding the door of God's presence or are we strategizing? 
John Stott, who, when he became the pastor of All Souls Church, he, he, he wrote, you know, there are 450 people at church on worship on Sunday and 25 at my house for prayer. And so he challenged them. Every Tuesday evening, on the second Tuesday of the month, they would get together for pray. And he would be there. And he, he would lament things like this. I wonder if the slow progress towards peace and evangelization is due to the prayerlessness of God's people. We should take the task of intercession so seriously. If local churches were to bow down before God every Sunday for 10 or 20 or 30 minutes, what might God be free to do? Hmm. So what's it gonna be? I, I, would, I would encourage you this week, take a little inventory of your life. If you don't know how to pray, find someone who knows how to pray. And if you're worried in your heart, oh man, I don't know anyone who knows how to pray, that tells you right there we have a problem. Like you're nervous. Dads in particular, do you, have you taught your kids how to pray? Do, have they seen you pray outside of a meal? Have you heard them pray because they're imitating you? You praying with your, your wife? You just, is prayer part of your family, dads? And then as a church, we're just inviting people to pray this year. Tonight is one opportunity, 630. What are we praying for? One, Lord, we are out of space. We have 200 more people on Sunday than we did a year ago. We have thought about this. We need to think less and pray more. We have tried to strategize about this. It's all been dead ends. Lord, give us a solution we're not thinking about. Pour out your spirit. And then when 200 more people come to Christ, <laughs> pouring out your spirit even more, please give us a solution. Lord, there is a Latino population in Bozeman. Eight out of 10 new students are not English speakers in Bozeman. There are people in this room who are Spanish speakers that wanna rally us to serve them. Lord, what are we gonna do? Lord, give us unity in the midst of an election cycle. Everything in the world is gonna try to tear us apart this year. Lord, Bozeman needs you. This city celebrates things it shouldn't. Campus needs you. The international students who come from everywhere need you. Our missionaries, we send far away. They need you. They need us to be an anchor, a lifeline, not just like something on the bulletin, but something we are invested in emotionally. Lord, we have a billion children in this church that you have entrusted to us. Help us. Much praying is not done because you don't plan to pray. We do not drift towards prayer. Everybody, amen? We don't drift towards godliness. We drift away. You have to make an effort. We will not grow in prayer unless we plan to pray. Did I say that right? Plan to pray. So I invite you, join me this year as I kind of fess up. Man, I've not done a good job on this. A year of shameless audacity to the Father who loves us. A year of praying together in a variety of ways starting tonight. Let's pray. Lord, uh, I think anytime I take an inventory, there's all the things I'm doing wrong. And uh, so we repent. If we have been, have missed out on the power that's at our disposal, Lord, we now ask you to pour it out on us. Pour out the power of your Holy Spirit that people would know you and treasure you and love you and that maybe you would bring things to the minds of everyone here, people to pray for things to pray for, people to go, people to care for. Help us to remember in Jesus' name, amen. We celebrate the Lord's Supper now. It's for those who have come to faith in Christ, been baptized, and are following Christ. There are no perfect people that come. If, if you're just like, dang, I'm convicted, guess what, this is perfect. Uh, this is for people who want to follow Christ and are unified with the people in this room. If you are, as far as it depends on you, not at peace with anyone in this room, there's an opportunity for you to do that right now. It could just be your spouse, like, sorry for this morning or 10 minutes ago. The logistics are, well, I'll pray and you guys will come in the middle. You guys, there's stuff on the sides there. Um, you can come as we sing. Here are the instructions. I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. So this is Paul talking about 
being passed on things that someone else had told him because he did not know Christ when he was on earth. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever you drink the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Those are intense words, right? No perfect people come up as you examine yourselves because you are proclaiming the gospel to yourself. But it's an opportunity for you to be renewed with the people in this room and with the Lord himself. So let's pray and then come to the table. And if you're not able to come, I will carry one to you. Father, I think everyone can say we are not great at examining ourselves. And when other people examine us, it's far worse and that we, we know you examine us and we can't even, we, we're just crushed when that happens. And yet we celebrate what you've done to us in rescuing us and your son being united to us so much so that he exalts us as he is exalted. And so we celebrate, we don't mourn, we celebrate what you've done in Jesus' name.